Morning with your kids. Hola, Niho, Konnichiwa, Assalamu alaikum, Shalom, Mahaba, Morimuli Wanji, Namaste, Jumbo, Bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted and so very honored that you are joining us in our mission to help all families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to tell all of your family and friends about the show, and please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Stitcher Radio, wherever you find your podcasts. Our guest today is Rachel Ignatovsky. She is here to celebrate the history of the computer. Before we invite Rachel into the studio, we want to let you know that this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by the power of empathy. Be the friend you've always wanted. It's number four in the Power Of series by Ruth Maley. This is another fantastic book by our friend Ruth Maley. Empathy can prevent bullying, help kids, make friends, and regulate emotions. Don't miss spending time with Orbit and his friends on their fourth adventure of the Power of Children's Book series. This beautifully illustrated story gently teaches young children how to recognize their emotions and the emotions of others. Children learn what it means to practice empathy by witnessing real-life examples that are easy for them to understand. This is a fantastic book. It's another in Ruth's Power of series. And all those books are absolutely fantastic. They deserve a spot in your family library. Get the latest book today, The Power of Empathy. Be the friend you've always wanted. This episode of the podcast is also brought to you by Letkus for Santa Claus, the amazingly fun book by Janie Emmaus. Jenny Mace's debut picture book, Lackas for Santa Claus, illustrated by the amazing Brian Langdo, is a delight. It was a finalist in the 2022 International Book Awards. In this humorous and endearing story, blending both Christmas and Hanukkah, a little girl and her stepbrother compete to leave Santa the best treats ever. It's a joyful, engaging read, perfect for culturally blended families and delightful for all readers. The playful rhymes will keep kids giggling. And and, and best of all, Janie's family latke recipe, which is included at the end of the book, is to die for. Watch for Janie's next blended holiday book, Easter Eggs and Matzo Ball, which will be coming out in January of 2023. It's a perfect season to add a latkes for Santa Claus to your family library. <laughs> Join us right now from Santa Barbara in California. Our guest is here today to celebrate her great new book. I have it here in our studio. It's called The History of the Computer, and it is absolutely beautiful. Please welcome to the show, Rachel Ignatovsky. Hey, Rachel, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm wonderful. I'm really happy that I pronounced your name correctly after the the little exchange we had before we started recording. I know. I you know. I blame my father and his father before him. That's who I blame. And um, if you hear any like birds or crows, um, that's because I'm enjoying the beautiful Santa Barbara weather, and I decided to do this podcast outside. So if there's like a caca in the back, just know they're they're friends. They're friends. They're bird friends. (laughs) <laughs> well, we are really happy. I'm uh, through the magic of technology that is being driven by computers somewhere. I'm able to sit here in my subterranean studios in Boston, where it's cold and rainy, and look out at Rachel and her smile and the sunshine and the foliage and the green all around her, and uh, it kind of warms me up here. Yeah, I'm. You know, I'm originally from the East Coast. And there was just a moment in my life where I said, I don't want to do winter anymore. And then I moved to Southern California. And now and now I feel like I made a deal with the devil. And I'm like, yum, I have oranges in my backyard. What, what, what are you going to do? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, my son just made a similar choice, uh, except he stayed on the East Coast, but he moved down to Orlando. And the home that he bought has a banana tree and it had a mango tree until Ian came along and knocked it down, but there's mango, uh, bananas and papayas in his backyard, and um, 
and he's not here to help me shovel the snow. Not that he was much of a help when he was here. But anyways, <laughs> be that as it may. So the history of the computer. Tell us about I, I love the book. It's, you know, has it's great designs and illustrations and graphics. And it's just one of those books that if I were in middle school, it would I, I would just, boom, this is the one I have. This is a book I have to have. Well, you know, I have been using computers to make art ever since I was seven years old. Like, um, I remember going into my library um, when I was just, like, in elementary school and seeing a matte color classic, and immediately I started drawing with it. And that was, like, the first time in my life where I was, like, wow. Like, I could feel being able to use a computer and how it changed me. Even as young as seven, I started saving color palettes, and it was just, like, another tool that I would use to make art, just like, you know, a box of crayons. Um, so I've always had technology in my life. It's always been a really big part of my artwork and a lens that I see life through. Um, and as an author and illustrator, I talk with teachers. You know how it is. You travel the country. You meet students all over the all over America. And um, a lot of them, you know, they use computers every day. They have phones in their pockets that are, you know, a million times more powerful than the Apollo computer that got the first astronauts to the moon, but they don't really know where it came from or know a lot about them. So that's why I wanted to create this book. I wanted to make the first ever fully illustrated book that talks about the history of computers that goes all the way to ancient times. Um, from ancient times, it goes all the way from that to modern day. So we cover 25,000 years of history, all with illustration. Wow, that is really incredible. And you know, you bring up a point that I've made to kids um, for for the last 30 years. When kids, when I go into a school and I'm doing my educational magic shows and kids are like, oh, wow, you do some magic and it's really cool. You were able to make that thing disappear and how did you do that magic? And oh, my goodness, you're so cool. And I always say to them, dude, you get something in your pocket that gives you the ability to send a message whether it's text, voice, video, to anybody in the world in a second. That is magic to me. And, and you know, it's really interesting that you, you use the phrase magic because that is actually something that, like, I hope this book kind of fights against because, you know, right now we have transistors that are microscopic. Um, and what a transistor is, it's just an on and off switch that, you know, it channels electricity in different ways. And that and, and through, you know, um, kind of these very simple sort of uh, on and off switches, we create these complex systems within our computers that we can then program. Um, and when something is that small and when things feel this instantaneous, it does feel like magic. But I hope to demystify that by talking not about the how computers are made, but the why we need computers and why humanity has always built tools to help them think bigger, I, I, I kind of want to take the magic out of it so then people can realize that these are tools that we build and we could just, and because we're building them, we can make choices around them. We can ask for better tools and um, that, you know, it's just kind of like, it's like how a hammer helps you strike a nail um, and that gives you the power to do that. These are just tools that help you think bigger. So um, I just want people to be in control of them and not feel like they're so, quote, unquote, magical, you know? Okay, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll buy that. I'll, I'll gr agree with you on that. You, you use the word tool, and I think mm -hmm. that's a really, I think that's a really, really important word for us to embrace when we're talking about technology, and, and especially for the parents that are listening to this show because I know a lot of parents out there, they're freaking out. They're like, TikTok is evil, and I'm scared, and <laughs> Instagram is like, whoa, my kids. And there's a lot, you know, there's there's a lot of issues around social media. Our kids need to know how to use social media appropriately and safely, the same way kids need to learn how to use a hammer or a chain. Oh, I don't want kids using chainsaws, but a hammer <laughs> or a saw or or any type of tool. You know, it, a, a hammer can be used to build something. It can be used to destroy something. It can be used to hurt somebody. And we teach kids how to use them responsibly. We need to, like you say, demystify, demagicify, while 
I'm going there. Uh, you know, demystify <laughs> technology so that we can teach our kids to use it safely and to help them understand that how we use technology is a choice. You know, and when we talk about social media, and that's what, uh, like we're talking about some very, very new software, um, very, very new communication software that just kind of, you know, connects everyone in the world very instantly. Um, but what's interesting about that is that by learning history, we can then kind of see how history sort of repeats itself. Um, when you look at computer history, you see a theme that emerges um, where um, the things that computers are used for, they're used by the very powerful few um, to, at times, uh, sort of, I wouldn't say control, but to, you know, account for mass populations, whether it's census taking or getting our taxes in order. And then um, a few people came and in the 1970s and liberated that technology so everyone could use it. And then it started to be, being used as a creative tool. Um, so if we talk about social media, um, I think it's really important for young kids to understand the power structures within social media. Um, what is social media actually for? And that kind of gets a little bit more away from computer history into sort of media theory. Um, and maybe this is like a little higher than elementary school when we talk about that, but it's, you have to think of if Instagram is a medium, what is the message of that media? It is to perpetuate Instagram. So when you're posting on it, it doesn't really, you know, what you say matters to an extent because the point of Instagram is to sell more ads and keep you on Instagram. So that can create a really toxic relationship with kids when they use social media because they don't really understand that, you know, their content is being used for advertising and then being um, rewarded for how good of a advertiser it is. Um, so, I mean, that kind of jumps into media theory, um, but social media is just such a small part of what computers can be used for. And I think that we get really bogged down by it because the type of um, computers that we mostly have are iPhones, um, which a lot of people kind of say are like sort of like post PC. Like if you think of a personal computer, it's a laptop or a desktop where you sit down and you can do real work with it. But with a, the way that a smartphone is kind of like the way that it's made and built. Uh, the example I like to give is a lot of people have read a book using their smartphone, but not a lot of books are written on a smartphone. So again, like when you're talking about the tools, you have to t think about like what we can use them for. And if the tools that most young people have are just to passively consume information and do quick posts on social media, then they're only going to see it as a social media tool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. These are, these are fascinating conversations. I have a feeling we could be talking for a week, but, I, <laughs> but we don't have a week. But what I do, you mentioned that, that, that the history of the computer goes back 25,000 years. So yes. take me back 25,000 years. Were, were there a couple of, of, of people using rocks or something to send oh, messages? Oh, yeah, yeah. Let me take you all the way back to, you know, there are, you know, Neolithic cave people. There, there, you know, um, think about this. The first math tool that we ever had was our fingers and our toes to keep track of the world around us. So it's like, how many people are in your small little tribe or your family? How many sheep do you own? Well, um, I'm going to keep track of them on my fingers and my toes. It's actually why numbers are called um, digits, because there are ah. little digit fingers. And it's also why a lot of things are base 10. So when life became too complicated to keep track on just, you know, your appendages, um, that's when the need arose for tool building. So um, people started carving on stones, they started notching on sticks, and they started drawing in the st sand what we now call um, abacuses. So they would draw counting boards in the sand, which then, you know, became tablets on rocks, beads on rope, um, and the traditional abacus that, you know, is still used today, the Sean Pan, which was actually developed kind of in medieval times that in the 1200 um, uh, common era in China, which is like still used today. Yeah. And you're not able to see this, but I just said, Rachel is so engaged and so animated. It is obvious that she loves this subject and it, it, it comes through in the book, but it also 
absolutely comes through in, in this conversation here. You're just um, bubbling over with enthusiasm. And so I don't want to get in the way of that. So from the abacus, what came next? Well, I mean, a lot of, I mean, there was the abacus, but there was also, you know, through like trade on the Silk Road and exchange of ideas, you know, a number system emerged um, that could be written down. So no longer did we have to kind of like represent things um, with like beads and strings or notches. Um, having written numbers um, made math a lot easier, and that's the Hindu Arabic system. And, you know, um, as math uh, advanced, um, you know, it kept up with the complexities of life. You know, this is why, you know, the pyramids could get built and like the Greek Colosseums could happen. Um, let's actually fast forward though to the industrial revolution because that's when another huge leap was made. So what is the industrial revolution known for? Well, it's assembly lines, factories, um, people doing repetitive tasks over and over again to um, do mass manufacturing. You know, no longer was a cobbler just making a shoe from from beginning to end. Now, you know, one person is working on the boot heel and another person's working on the buttons. Um, the same thing was happening in mathematics. Um, people whose job title was human computer, um, these these computers, they would get together and they would do small parts of a more complicated math equations. Um, basically, they were doing an assembly line for mental labor. And this was to create reference tables, nautical tables, um, ballistic trajectories, things that were used by the government, by the Navy, um, to really like kind of just keep momentum going with whatever, you know, businesses were happening at the time. Um, so, there was one mathematician in the UK, Charles Babbage, who was fed up with this super boring work of checking mathematical tables. And in fact, one day he screamed out, oh, I wish to God these, these math, I, he said, I wish to God these calculations could be done by steam. So he got this great idea to, um, inspired by, you know, clocks and, um, punch cards to sort of build a mathematical calculator that could help him aid in these uh, in, in creating these tables. So he created the difference engine and the analytical engine. And the analytical engine actually was, um, in theory, the very first programmable computer and has lots of components that a modern computer has now. Now, when I say he built this, I meant he designed it. These machines were way too complicated to ever actually get built. We're talking thousands and thousands of metal gears, huge, large machines, and uh, Charles Babbage actually fought a lot with his machinists. And so although these things, um, these machines never got built, um, they were kind of the primordial ooze that the next generation of computer scientists and engineers would use as inspiration to build the first programmable computers. Wow. That it that's really fascinating to think that, you know, our 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 smartphones, this laptop that I'm using to speak to you, was inspired by thoughts and dreams that happened a uh, hundred years ago. You know, it's what's really interesting is that as life becomes more complicated and society um continued to grow, especially after the Industrial Revolution, we had to create tools to keep up with all of that new information. Just the need to process data is a need that governments and bureaucracies and big businesses have. Um, you know, it was actually the United States Census in the 1890s that started the company that would go on to become IBM. Um, in uh, the 1890s, the census became, uh, there was too many people living in the United States, basically. Um, we're required to do a census every 10 years, and it would be impossible to calculate the United States census by hand. So what happened? Well, they held, the United States held a competition, um, and engineers came up with inventions that could help tabulate and count um, and store the data for the for us so we wouldn't have to do it all by hand so um the hollerith tabulator got created um they were able to do work that would have taken them you know over 10 years and just a couple of years and from that it, um you know ibm was created which then became probably like one of the 
most influential computer companies in the 20th century. Yeah, uh, this is this is fascinating. <laughs> it really is, and it really is. And you really have a passion for sharing science and STEM knowledge with kids. Where where does that come from? Because Typically, when you hear about, about an artist, you think, oh, artists, and they're kind of uh, in their mind and creative. And STEM is very, very, um, you know, fact is here. And um, sometimes people don't see the two, the, the creative and the STEM, as, as joining together. I certainly understand that there's a lot of creativity in STEM. But what is it that makes you so passionate about STEM? Well, I actually have a graphic design background, mm -hmm. and what a graphic design background is, is, you know, we go to school and we learn how to organize dense information to take a bunch of type on the page and make it so that the reader can understand it at a glance. So they don't even actually have to think of themselves as reading. They just see it. And we use these skills to sell things. Um, that's kind of what we're trying to do. Like, uh, we're used to, you know, graphic designers will... Uh, work for ad agencies to sell Coca-Cola. And what is a Coca-Cola ad but the ability to tell a story instantaneously? So after I graduated from school, I thought, what if I could use my skills as a graphic designer and instead of selling, you know, a new car or, you know, a bottle of soda, what if I could sell education? Like, mm -hmm. what if I could make it so people felt confident to learn more about complicated subjects that are really important. So I like to use my skills in illustration to make topics that could seem a little daunting to learn, like computer history, like climate change, um, like um, women's history, all topics that I've dealt with in the past. I like to make it so that any reader can approach them easily and excitedly. And I do that with you know, simply by drawing smiley faces on everything and drawing fun <laughs> illustrations and also uh, taking taking the type and, and kind of arranging it on a page where the, the reader could just glance at it and start absorbing and learning without really realizing what they're doing. Yeah. So that's what I love to do. So one of the things that I ask author illustrators when they come on is what comes first, the story or the illustration? And I've gotten probably 50-50. Some illustrators come on, author illustrators come on and say, I, I had this character in my mind and I started drawing it. And after I started drawing it, the story came to me. And then the opposite, you know, I have a story and that inspires the art. With you, I'm imagining the research comes first before the des yeah. design? Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, you totally got it. Yeah. <laughs> I finally <laughs> got it. <laughs> <laughs> the re and I think that's like something that, um, especially like if you go to school, to art school and you are on the commercial side of things um, in your schooling, it, it, everything has to be there for a reason, you know? And that means that no matter what you're doing, the research is the driver of the illustration. What do they say in like design school? It's um, uh, function, f form follows function. And so if you think of that with even illustration, that means that the research kind of drives the choices that you make. So in this book, you could see there's all these different um, sort of graphic motifs that I put throughout. And a lot of those are inspired by looking at old advertisements from the 1700s, um, commercials from the 1980s. I wanted to make it so that the viewer felt like they were traveling in time. And I wouldn't have been able to do that if I didn't really deep dive into research before I started working. Yeah. What do you, uh, we have some illustrators, um, and I have this one illustrator in particular who's been helping us uh, lately. She's in the Philippines, and she's created a series of, of graphics, to, uh, you know, different designs for our logo. What advice would you give to her and to other aspiring illustrators and designers? The best advice that I can give is, um, when always be having a side project. I know that sounds kind of goofy, but a side project will feed your soul, feed your heart, and also bring you kind of like the kind of work that you want to be doing. Every single illustrator and graphic designer I know who has made it big um, 
always had a personal side project going that was just as important to them as the work that they were getting paid to do. And I know, like, saying, like, here's more work, uh, I mean, that's that's a lot to put on illustrators out there because I know how hard you guys work already, but that's the only way you're going to be able to get the kind of jobs that you want to do. It's kind of by showing the world uh, your heart and soul. Ah. So while you're doing the grind to make the money to pay the bills, on the side, do that stuff that you love, and eventually you get paid for that. Yeah, just make make the time to do it. It's really important, especially for young illustrators. Um, you'll thank yourself when you're older. <laughs> yeah. So you, you've created a number of, of fantastic books. Is there a subject out there that you – really want to dive into, but you haven't had a chance to do it yet? You know, it's really funny that you say that because I'm actually working on several new books right now. So um, the answer is yes, and I am diving into them because I can't awesome. help myself. <laughs> so um, I created this book, um, and I, I cover all sorts of STEM topics because I just – the more you know about your world, the more you can grow as a person. And I'm like, I'm just like very greedy and hungry for information. So like, I kind of make all my books are an excuse to like, for me to learn more about the world. So um, I started this series. I'm very much inspired by um, kind of like where I live right now in Santa Barbara called What's Inside a Flower. And that's basic backyard biology on elementary school curriculum. And from that book, we've done a whole series. So I have just finished um, What's Inside a Caterpillar's Cocoon, Ooh. which is going to come out, um, I believe, next fall. And I'm really excited about it. I just turned in the last piece of artwork. And I'm literally just about to start, start What's Inside a Bird's Nest. And all this has given me excuses to go birding, to, um, to talk with, like, uh, scientists at natural history museums and to like just really explore um, the natural world all around me. So like we've been planting milkweed in our yard, inviting all the butterflies. It's just been really, really cute. And I know that's very, very different from the history of the computer, but you know, the world has a lot to learn about and I'm not going to limit myself for, to just one topic. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, well, I can't wait to, I, you have to promise to come back when that bird book is out. Yes, I 100% I will. Um, are you a big birder? I, well, I, I, I've become one. My, our our, our pro property here in the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in, in, in Boston, we live, we're, we're on the city limits of Boston. On the other side of my property is a bird sanctuary. So, And, and they don't know fences. So they, all, <laughs> they come into our backyard and we have also, and the thing that fascinated me is, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, a robin made a nest in our holly bush. So it was something that we could see, and we could see it from our, our front window, and we could go out and look, and and it was fascinating. We watched the, the, the babies hatch and, and you know, then, then leave, and then eventually they left the nest. But the thing that blew my mind was right around that time when the robins had, had left, and I'm looking at this incredible piece of construction this this nest that was built by a bird and then i i had a guest on that wrote a book about robin's nest and it was identical to the thing that was in my <laughs> home i'm like wait a minute is there like a, a home depot for robins they go out there and they get the same you know supplies and, and blueprints and every, i was just i'm fascinated by that well, it's interesting that you use the word blueprint because um, birds are all born already knowing how to build their nest. It's not learned behavior. It's pure instinct. So they do have the blueprint in their head about what the kind of things they need to collect, where to build, um, pure instinct. When we, we talk about bird brains, um, <laughs> it's kind of like, oh, they have bird brains. They're so like, you know, they got small little brains and they're just like silly and simple. But, um, you know... That simplicity is also what allows them to have the instinct to build complicated structures. We have to learn everything. Mm -hmm. We have complicated big old brains that have to learn. They're born knowing these things. It's wild. Yeah. And one of the things that I know and, and I want to encourage families, I'm, in a minute I'm going to ask you where your website is, but yes. it's your enthusiasm. It's like me. I'm I'm almost a hundred years old, and I'm excited to learn about this stuff. I'm excited when that little yellow bird that comes back every summer comes in and always kind of makes this nest on the same branch. 
in our in our backyard, and I get to see them from the hammock, and that stuff fascinates me. And you are obviously fascinated with this, and I know that your books, I, I know the history of the computer, and your other books are going to help families instill that that wonder in their kids. And I think that's one of the best gifts we can give our kids. I think, like you know, kids are constantly interacting with technology. And at the same time, we are also part, very much part of this big interconnected natural world. These are both topics I love living in. And um, when it comes to the history of the computer, my biggest hope for this book is that it inspires kids to understand history, to understand science, and to look at the tools that they have access to these computers that are in their room that they're using for their homework that they're using for their you know to play video games and to see them as the collaborative tools for creation that they really are not just passive tools to scroll on facebook they are they're they're there for you to build things and to explore the world and to learn more and to you know make friends and make connections and build a better world. But we have to understand them to be able to do that. First. Absolutely. Absolutely. So where can people go to find out more about you and find out more about the history of the computer? So the history of the computer is sold at your favorite bookstore. So just go into your favorite bookstore, wherever you like to buy books and ask for this. My name is Rachel Ignatovsky. I'm the only Rachel Ignatovsky in the world. So all you have to do is pop my name into Google. My website will come up, rachelignatovskydesign.com. And you can follow me on Instagram at Rachel Ignatovsky. So have fun spelling my last name, everyone. <laughs> well, we will hopefully spell it correctly in the show notes. So you can also <laughs> refer. The... <laughs> and if you, if it's uh, we don't spell it right, let me know. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> I, I think you'll get it. It's 10 letters. It starts with an I. I believe in you guys. <laughs> We've had a really, really fun time speaking about the history of the computer and a bunch of other stuff with our guest, Rachel Ignatowski. Hey, Rachel, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. You guys can't see it, but he has birds on his shirt, so we <laughs> talked about everything. Um, <laughs> um, thank you so much, and I hope to be back to talk more science with you later. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our amazing intern, Jordan Saley, will be here to interview Kathleen Stroll-Miller. I think you're going to enjoy the conversation. I really did. Hey, I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, I want to start by thanking our guest, Rachel Ignatovsky. Wasn't she so much fun? I, I just loved having her on. I also want to thank our sponsors, Ruth Maley. Be sure to check out The Power of Empathy. Be the friend you've always wanted. And Janie Emmaus. Be sure to check out Lacus for Santa. And also be sure to try that uh, family Laka recipe that's in the back of the book. I can't wait to try it myself. I want to thank my team, Fatima Khan, Rory Brady, Jordan Saley, Mirabella Q, Skylar Strauss. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast.